I I want to graduate towards the idea uh, that is slightly less technical and uh-huh. since most of the people who are listening to this podcast are I would say people who are interested in research or I would say masters or PhD uh-huh. students so I want to uh-huh. ask a question about along the lines of uh, understanding your thought process when you were a PhD student so uh-huh. first of all how did how did you decide your own PhD research topic and secondly would you have any advice uh, for people who are trying to develop the research topic or thesis or in general the idea that what they want to work on uh, so can, can you talk to more about like what was your thought process then yeah so um i think i think developing that and and you know i think oftentimes like uh maybe something close to what i would advise people i, I think is also probably my experience just because organically this is often like the way things turn out to be but um yeah i guess it's like some combination sort of high level it's some combination of exploration to find out you know what you're really excited about and then once you found something that's more exciting you can then you know really push on that and really flesh it out as a direction um in terms of exploring so like i think um so i think like concretely you know maybe you want to be doing some combination of you know spending time really like learning about like um certain papers or techniques that you start off being excited about um and then at the same time you're trying to work on concrete projects to understand um like to really dive into the details of um like of, of trying to do research there and these two things sort of feed off of each other like um when you first start reading papers it's you know it's illuminating and it's interesting but um the depth in which you understand them is different once you've started doing research yourself in that area because you better understand you know what are the important parts what are the less important parts what are you most interested by what's less exciting to you things like that um and so you like kind of go back and forth between these um i'd say for like starting phd students i would recommend you know like doing this for maybe um it's sequentially but like you know sequentially for like a couple of different areas they're excited about so maybe you pick one area and then you try and learn about it work on a project too and you're doing a combination of following that area and then also trying to work on a project um try and wrap up that project also or like you know like see the project to completion is what i would say because um that like that process of working through a project until it's like a a paper is like really a, an important part of doing research also um so you do that and then you get some sense of that area and then maybe you pick another area that you're excited about um or or like or somehow if the first area you picked is just magical then maybe you just continue <laughs> you, you found the area you're really excited about um and so then but um but if not and you're you know excited about other areas also maybe you know you do this again or you you do this a couple of times basically like a few times and so then once you've done that you've written a few papers you've gotten a sense of what that process is like you know what doing research is like you learned a lot about the field um and then at that stage you can start getting a sense of like okay well you know what did i like most about this like what direction would i like to go how am i seeing like you know things like evolve in the field also what's like the new work coming out that's exciting me and so then and then that will like um help maybe inform like the the next set of projects you start working on um and then by that point like you know slowly cookies like a, a theme will start forming um and so then like a some like at some stage like you know a few years in to your phd you can usually look at all the work you've done and there's like you know some clearer themes that are coming out of that um and so then i think like you know kind of maybe midway or like in the like latter half of your phd or so like that's when you're sort of taking some of the themes that are coming out and then like maybe really pushing on them to um because you realize that those are like the directions you're most interested in and then you're like maybe exploring them to like their full or like studying other questions there that you thought were interesting that like came out um this yeah. process also gets easier once again like i mean one other nice thing about like actually doing the research is um in some ways this process also gets easier once you've actually written some papers because through the process of doing that you can usually look back at your own papers and be like ah oh, but i wish you'd like answer these questions or things like that <laughs> and that like also feeds into um you know directions to go in or like uh ways to ways to form like a a body of work i guess you know like a okay so some people might come into it like typically if you've had some research experience already or you've been following some research area very closely and you've decided you're interested in that then chances are like you probably have a good read of it and you should just go do that um but alternatively what happens is sometimes people come into it and you know they have like an a range of interests but like they're not quite sure the exact like thing that they're interested in or they're interested in exploring a few things um and then in that case like you know it's nice to you know try out like a few things just to get a sense of it and then that will also give you a sense of what you like and then you can kind of go from there 
yeah 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 definitely yeah um, i mean by brute force i meant like in a in a strictly domain like you will have to pick up a domain where you will be doing a lot of um, explorations but yeah 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 that's 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 very interesting but, but and, still, and, still, uh, still guided by your interests like you should still look at that yeah and, <laughs> the, like the question you decide to work on should excite you like if you pick some question and you're like i'm not sure why i'm working on this that's like not the <laughs> not the best thing to do <laughs> yeah that makes sense that makes sense Good. so i actually okay so i interviewed for my phd um with Roz's group at mit with the I, the following idea i wanted to make an autism prosthetic so i wanted to have google glass look at the images of the person you were talking to detect their facial expression and display it to you so it would say this person seems bored maybe you should stop talking right now something like this <laughs> um and I like I just found this I thought this was going to be so cool. It was much more of an HCI project. Um like, you know, the facial expression recognition was not a key focus of the project. You probably use a pre-existing tool. Um by the time I joined the lab, that was in March or something. By the time I'd actually joined Ross's lab in September, someone else had done that project. Um I think he actually started a started a company out of it. So he was at Stanford. I forget his name, I'm sorry. Um but so that exists the autism prosthetic Google Glass thing. Although I guess now that Google Glass doesn't exist anymore, I don't know what happened, but that was the, that was the idea. Had to pivot, um, took machine learning uh, my first semester. And I think, you know what it was? Okay, I was originally doing much more like, okay, I'll tell you the whole story. I'm getting excited about this now. Yeah, so I, I did a, an undergrad in both computer science and psychology. And I was pretty, you know, psychology was having sort of a replication crisis um, where studies weren't replicating. And a lot of what I learned in my undergrad was like stuff Freud said, which is to me like not good science. It's like, right. And so it's just like, this is not data driven. Like what is the going on here? So I had this dream of like, I want to use machine learning to understand like psychological questions and like use machine learning as the next set of statistical tools. Like psychology already uses a lot of statistics. Can we use machine learning to get better answers? So that's sort of where I started. But what happened is I went to my first Neurips in 2015 and I just fell in love with it because I was like, oh my God, we're living in the future. Look at how cool this is. AI is real. This is happening. Like I was so excited. You know, a bunch of results where I'm like, oh my God, like AI is so good. Things are really happening. And then I just, I switched. I really moved away from what my advisor works on during my PhD. Um, so that was... Uh, somewhat challenging. By the time I was like writing up my thesis, which I think is your question, you know, it was, things had changed significantly. And so I think it was more like trying to show the affect of computing flavor in the deep learning and deep reinforcement learning problems I was working on. Yeah. So I'll give you, uh, this is something I've thought about and I'll give you uh, answers which multiple pathways in order to connect with AI for social media. The simplest way, perhaps, one that I have adopted in my research group is um, we just call up nonprofits in our local area or even internationally, it doesn't matter. Um, so we'll just say, hey, you know, nonprofit in Boston area, is there anything we can do for you? And maybe some people will say they don't, you know, they don't need us, but there may be some who actually are sitting on data and find AI expertise to be used. And uh, we've held meetings where we'll call, call in multiple nonprofits to our university, have a workshop. Uh, the nonprofits will pitch their problems. Our students will listen and say, ah, I, can, I can work on that problem. And this has led to some uh, projects. So this is certainly happening. Um, another is, uh, you know, sometimes there'll be professors in other departments, uh, School of Public Health, for example, or School of Social Work. And uh, you know you find friends there, and they're working on interesting problems. And again, there can be collaborations there. Uh, I found in my classroom, I basically invited nonprofits to come and give lectures. So they'll come and pitch problems and say, "Hey, you know, this is uh, the problem we're working on." And class projects that will ultimately lead to bigger projects. So that's another avenue. In addition, as I said, at Google Research India, we have a call, it's been happening now, it's happened twice every year, we'll put out a call where it's like, uh, if you are a researcher, you can apply. If it's a nonprofit, you can apply. And then we engage in life matchmaking to launch AI for social good projects. And so that might be, I mean, 
that might be another avenue. And there we also fund uh, the researchers and the nonprofit to work together. So if it's a young research, you know, if they're a young researcher, they might want to look at this. So there are all these ways in which if you are keen on AI for social impact, that it is possible. And sometimes people, you know, if none of these avenues work, I've often I've, uh, talked to some students saying, you know, your family circle, your friend circle, there'll be someone, you know, who knows like, okay, there's a nonprofit thing that they're working on and they would love to use your expertise um, for, uh, you know, using AI for social good for, and maybe initially it starts small, you know, it's not uh, the world's biggest AI research problem to start with. But once the trust starts to, starts to develop and both sides understand each other, there can be new ideas that come in that have not been thought of before. And the right. project goes in like a very, very interesting in new directions. Yeah, I really like the idea of where you started the point, like you you have lab meetings where you would invite these real world problems or people who are working on real world problems to bring into the lab and then ask, can AI do that? Which is something I really, really find interesting. And luckily, I have, I have found few professors who do that. And I, I can see the impact, even though I haven't been like, I'm still on my pathway to there, but I can see how that really motivates people to uh, lead that pathway. Yeah. And so this comes back to a question of like, what kind of impact do you want to have with your work? Because actually, like my original affective computing work, we did a lot of work on better models to predict um, happiness and health and stress in people, given their like everyday data from their smartphone or their wristwatch sensor and stuff like that. And there was actually like a startup interested in following up on our work and like deploying it. So in a sense, that's like closer to to being deployed and touching a real human. Hmm. And so I think that in a sense, is pretty meaningful. Now the stuff I'm doing, it's like little dots running around in a grid world. <laughs> like, when is this going to be useful, right? But yeah. maybe there's something about like trying to go upstream. Like if you if you invent something that uh, a lot of other people end up using in various ways, then maybe that's... Not that I'm doing that, but, you know. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now coming to the point of the topics and so on, obviously, like I think you know, your topic would influence like how much in demand you are by the time you graduate and so on. But those are, I would say this is like saying, okay, is there a way that I can try to optimize my life in such a way that I win a Turing Award, right? Like, no, there isn't. <laughs> um, so that's, I think, a question that has so many other things that come into play that you might start with a great topic that is very popular and by the end of five years, nobody might care about it anymore, right? Uh, yeah. So that's where I think having like a one foot each on being a little realistic at the same time, adding your own interests in the picture would be helpful because if you are very excited about something, even if like the demand for that is like slightly low by the time you graduate, you will still stand out because you would have probably done great work in it. You know, you would, you will find some or the other venues to like, have a livelihood with it and so on, right? So I, I think it should be some kind of a combination of what will realistically still be useful and also, you know, uh, like your interest, right? And that it, you're going to fail. Uh, that's going to happen. But really try to understand, like, basically, you're going to spend lots of time finding silly bugs and lots of time, like, basically, like, finding sort of silly uh, things in your code or like really understanding very, very small nitty gritties. I think that's really important uh, because uh, one that actually helps you like basically get your hands dirty and figure out what like what is really happening at the sort of, you know, matrix operation level. Why is this gradient not right? So, you know, just like try to derive it yourself, try to figure out, okay, when given this input, what should be the gradient and then look at the gradient and it's not the same. Why is it not the same? So, Basically, trying to get into such a habit uh, helps you understand like how these blocks come together. And especially when you're starting out, I think that's super, super valuable. Uh, so like when I started out, we didn't have automatic differentiation. So we would actually like this is how we used to write like, you know, backwards passes and they really like derive it on paper and then code it up. And I think that really helps because a lot of the times, you know, there were lots of silly assumptions that I had in my mind. Like, things weren't clear how it happens. You know, you just see the paper and you want like see how people have done it, but you don't really 
really understand what's going on uh, right. and i think that's pretty important to see uh, get your hands dirty and basically figure out how to and you're going to fail at it lots of times and that's fine everyone does